Now, flying under the radar is an expression that we sometimes hear. It's used to describe something or someone that is not readily noticed. So we hear expressions like, well, that event took me by surprise. It really flew under the radar. Or, wow, that player is really going well today. I've, I've barely noticed him. He's, he's really flying under the radar. Planes sometimes fly under the radar. A radar travels in a straight line, and because the Earth is round, planes can fly really low, and if they want to come up upon the enemy by surprise, military aircraft fly under the radar. We're currently reading the book of Acts in our daily Bible readings, and I'm going to leave you with something this morning that will help you, I hope, as we read through the rest of Acts, because I think we're only up to chapter 8, as we read through the rest of Acts, that hopefully you'll be able to appreciate more readily. There are a lot of wonderful characters in the book of Acts. Uh, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, men like Barnabas. And we know them so very well. They're very prominent as we read the record of Acts. Uh, but there are others in the book of Acts. And there's one particular person who flies under the radar when we read through the book of Acts. He's certainly there in the record. He certainly plays a key role in some of the events in the book of Acts. But we don't notice him. He's not even named. And I'm referring to Luke. He's actually the author of this book of Acts. Luke the author. And Luke's there in the record of Acts as we'll see in a few moments, but he's hardly noticed. He flies under the radar when we're reading through the record of Acts. We ask the question, well, how prominent is Luke in the Bible? Think about it, brothers and sisters. Um, how many Bible passages refer to Luke, the author of, of the Gospel and the author of the book of Acts? Well, it's only mentioned three times by name in the Bible, and we'll refer to those three passages as we go through our exhortation this morning. Cursed three times, and yet would it be a surprise to you that Luke wrote approximately 25% of our New Testament? And along with Paul, Luke, who we hardly know, He's the most prolific writer of our New Testament. And we think, well, we don't know much about Luke at all. Well, hopefully through our exhortation we'll come to know a little bit more about Luke, one who flies under the radar. The book of Acts is his volume two. Luke's volume one is, of course, the Gospel of Luke. And this is, as he writes himself, is a record of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Volume 1 of Luke, it's about Jesus Christ. Volume 2, well, it's about what happens next after what Jesus did and what Jesus taught. It's a record of, of the Acts of the Apostles. I remember reading somewhere that some think that the original title of Acts may not have been the Acts of the Apostles, but the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is there driving the work of the gospel proclamation during the times of the first century, the acts of the Holy Spirit. And so that's volume two of the pen of Luke. Both volumes were written to a person known as Theophilus, and that's the giveaway when we read in Acts 1 and verse 1 that it's written to Theophilus, the same person to whom uh, the Gospel of Luke was written to. So Theophilus was perhaps the patron um, and a convert. And Luke writes volume 1 and volume 2 to others, including uh, most noble, noble Theophilus. And hopefully with our exhortation this morning, brothers and sisters, we'll see some very powerful and very practical lessons coming out of Luke the person and the way Luke writes. Luke is a very unique gospel writer. He's unique when we look at the four gospel writers. Matthew, Mark and John were all Jewish. Luke is different. 
not Jewish, he's Greek. Matthew, Mark, and John were all eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. And when they wrote about Jesus Christ, they, they remember seeing and hearing Jesus Christ, and they wrote their records as eyewitnesses. Luke, Luke's not an eyewitness of the events of the life of Jesus Christ. He writes his gospel record from what he's heard from others. And so he went around and heard details of the life of Jesus Christ, and he put together a quite magnificent account of the life of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but you know, some of you might have a favourite gospel record. Um, I certainly do, and it's, it's Luke. Uh, Luke's quite a beautiful gospel record. Luke contains things which other gospel records don't contain. And it's estimated that 50% of Luke's gospel record is not found in the others. And so much of Luke's gospel is unique. And some of what he includes, which are excluded by the others, are very notable stories, and they're rather beautiful stories. It's, it's, it's stories which have got a very human, a very personal touch, stories which, which draw upon the pangs of one's heart, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the conversion of Zacchaeus, the woman in the house of Simon the Pharisee who's on her knees or on her feet, sorry, on, on, on the feet of Jesus, weeping and sobbing, the thief on the cross and the, the pathos of the exchange between Jesus and the thief upon the cross. And they're all in Luke, but not in Matthew, Mark or John. You see, Matthew portrays Jesus as the king. Mark, the servant, John, the son of God, but far as Luke is concerned, he's presenting Jesus as the son of man. Very human stories. And they're beautiful stories of ones I've mentioned, but we shouldn't look at them as simply nice stories or nice parables. Uh, they lose their impact if we don't see ourselves, brothers and sisters, in those type of stories. Uh, for instance, we need to read the parable of the lost sheep. We need to see ourselves as a sheep that's gone astray, a sheep that's been silly and gone astray and, and only saved by a very diligent and a very loving shepherd that goes out of his way to save and to rescue. We need to see ourselves as that prodigal son, wayward, but we come to our senses and we've got a loving father who's wanting us to return and he's so overjoyed when we do make the decision to return. We need to see ourselves as that person who's beaten up and half dead upon the road. People that have been beaten up by sin and only rescued because there's a loving outcast that comes and saves us. And we need to be like Zacchaeus and totally surprised that the Son of God would have anything to do with us based upon our past. But we're prepared to do a 180 degree turnaround like Zacchaeus and respond to the, the interest that the Son of God has in our life. And like that desperate sinner in the house of Simon the Pharisee, we need to see ourselves at the feet of our Saviour, weeping and sobbing. We need to love much because we've been forgiven much. We need to see ourselves crucified with Christ, hanging there like that thief. Justly so. We're rightly related to death and we, we hang there and we identify with our Lord Jesus Christ and our heartfelt plea is that, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so they're beautiful stories in Luke, but we need to see ourselves in each of those stories and more so as we, 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 we take the time to read through the Gospel of Luke. We turn to Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. We have here perhaps the summary of Luke's Gospel record. Luke 19 and verse 10. 
It's the account of Zacchaeus, which we've referred to just a few moments ago. And at the end of this account of, of the Lord coming into the life of Zacchaeus, the record in Luke 19 verse 10 says, For the Son of Man, that's how Luke portrays Jesus, he's the Son of Man, is come to seek and to save that which is lost. So the Gospel of Luke portrays the Lord as seeking, caring and saving others that are in need of help and assistance. Those who are spiritually lost, the Lord putting the interests of others before his own interests. And when Luke, not an eyewitness of the events of Jesus Christ, he didn't see Zacchaeus. Uh, he, he, he wasn't there when Jesus spoke those parables. But he hears about these parables and he hears about Zacchaeus. And he puts these stories together because they're stories that really touch the heart of Luke. He's that type of person. And these stories touch his heart and he includes them in his gospel narrative. Now let's go to Colossians 4 and verse 12 where we have one of the three references to Luke in the Bible. Colossians 4 and verse 14, rather. Here in Colossians 4, Paul refers to many of his companions, many of his fellow labourers. Uh, he refers, for instance, to Tychicus in, in verse 7. In verse 9, there's Onesimus. Uh, verse 10, he refers to Aristarchus. Um, verse 12, he refers to Epaphras. Uh, they were his fellow labourers in the gospel work. Paul needed brothers and sisters around him. And it's a, let's not think that Paul was just this great character that needed nobody. He needed the company of others to encourage and help him. And he says that at the end of verse 11. He says, These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. And so he saw his fellow workers in the truth as as people that had the same focus, the same interest in the coming kingdom of God. That's what drove them forward. And he says at the end of verse 11, these individuals have been a comfort to me. And that, that word comfort means to soothe. It, it's pain relief. The Apostle Paul had a life of much pain. And these brothers that were there for Paul at key stages in his life, they meant so much to him because they helped relieve the pain. And in verse 14, one of these fellow laborers, one of these fellow workers is, is Luke, the beloved physician. The word beloved there is taken from the Greek word agape, which is a deep love that is far more intense than a mere friendship or a, 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 a mere tender affection. And the word physician comes from the Greek word meaning to cure, to heal, to make whole. And, and so to Paul, Luke was not simply a doctor, not simply a physician that could tend to Paul's wounds when Paul encountered beatings and so forth. And I'm sure Luke would have been there at key stages in Paul's life when Paul did receive beatings to help heal those wounds because he's a doctor. But as far as Paul's concerned, he's, he's a beloved physician, a great spirit of friendship and companionship, of love existed between Paul the Apostle and, and this doctor that came into the truth and that came attached to the life of the Apostle Paul. Another of the three references to uh, Luke uh, in the Bible is in the book of Philemon. So turn to Philemon, which is sometimes a bit of a tricky book to find because it's so small, it's up near Hebrews. Just before Hebrews, we have uh, the, the book of Philemon, Paul's lovely letter to uh, a brother in Christ who lived in the city of Colossae. A lovely little letter, and in that letter, Paul talks about Luke in verses 23 and 24 of his letter to Philemon. 
there salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas. These are my fellow labourers. And so listing down fellow labourers, uh, he highlights Luke there in the record. And so Luke was a fellow labourer with Paul, working alongside Paul to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so let's now spend a few moments in our exhortation looking at Luke as a fellow labourer with the Apostle Paul. And, and that's where he's in the book of Acts, but he's, he's flying under the radar. Modestly, the author of this record doesn't, in, doesn't include, oh, Luke's there in the record, and Luke's doing this, and Luke's doing that. We, we wouldn't know Luke was there because he's not mentioned except by a few giveaways, which we'll see in a few moments. But he's there in the record of Acts, labouring alongside the Apostle Paul. Well, let's turn to the record of Acts. In, a, in about a week's time, we'll read of Acts 16. So let's turn to Acts 16. Uh, Paul's um, about to go into the area of Greece. He's on his second missionary journey. We find in Acts 16 and verses 9 and 10. Paul was in Troas, but a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Verse 9. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. So Paul receives a vision. Obviously, God is directing him to the area of Greece, to, to Macedonia, and then into Greece, which is south of Macedonia. Come over to these areas and help us. And for whatever reason, God sees a need for Paul not to spend time in Asia, because Asia comes later during his third journey, but it's to Macedonia and to Greece. And verse 10 and after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavoured to go into Macedonia. And the word we suggests or indicates that Luke is now in that company. Again, no fanfare, no trumpets, but simply we. Luke modestly flies under the radar. And so he's in that group. And who else is in the group? Well, we know at least there's Paul, there's Silas, there's Timothy, and there's Luke. At least four people now engaged in the gospel work in the region of Macedonia and in Greece. And we know what happens in chapter 16. They go over to Philippi. And there at Philippi, Paul and Silas the two Jews within that company are taken by the authorities and given a beating. So the two Jews, it's, it's not Timothy who's part Greek. It's not Luke who's possibly Greek. And so the Philippians take the Jews in that group and they beat them. And they put them into prison. And we know the story of what happens. There's the beatings and the, the imprisonment of Paul and Silas, the two Jews of the group. But then there's the, uh, the earthquake at midnight and the prison doors come out and, and Paul, who to all intents and purposes is like a death, is, is gone down into the inner prison. He and Silas is like a death. It's, it's then like there's a resurrection there. The doors are sprung open and, and out come... Uh, Paul and Silas. And we know the record they're taken to the house of the jailer. And in verse 33, it talks about the jailer tending to the wounds of, of Paul and Silas. And, and even though it's not recorded there, my mind goes to, to Luke. He's a doctor. I can't imagine Luke not being called by the jailer to come to see both his friend but also to tend to the severe wounds on the back of his friends, both Paul and Silas. And so you look at verse 33, 
and he, that is the jailer, took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptised, he and all his house, straightway. I think Luke is in that verse as well. And Luke would have been there tending to the stripes. It's interesting that word stripes is the same Greek word. It's not used very much in the New Testament. It's used for the record of the story of the Good Samaritan, the story that Luke had wrote in his gospel record of a, a person that suffered wounds, a person that was lying upon the, the ground with wounds and the Good Samaritan tended the wounds or the stripes of that man that was attacked by the robbers. And the same word is used there in verse 33 of the stripes that were washed by the jailer, but I suspect also tended by, by Luke. So Luke is a man who has care and kindness. There's love and compassion in the character of Luke. Well, we find in verse 40 that Luke writes, And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, we, we comforted them in the part. No, they. And so Paul and Silas go from Philippi, but Luke doesn't go. And, and the record there in verse 40 suggests quite clearly that the poor strategy, and it was poor strategy as he preached, is to, to leave, if possible, one of his fellow labourers at a centre to consolidate the work of that ecclesian. So Paul and Silas, Timothy, move off to Berea and they leave Luke there at Philippi to help this young ecclesia grow and establish. We know nothing what Luke does during this period of time. He stays there in Philippi for a period of perhaps six, seven, eight years. And, and true to Luke's style of one who flies under the radar, there's nothing recorded in the book of Acts of the, the wonderful work that Luke does here at Philippi. But Luke's there beavering away and, and helping the brothers and sisters of this small and new ecclesia develop. But I believe we see the legacy and the result of his labours at Philippi in the spirit that existed within the, in the ecclesia at Philippi. It's quite obvious when we read of Paul's letters that the brothers and sisters at Philippi occupied a very special place in Paul's heart. His language is so soft and tender and gentle. He loved the brothers and sisters there at Philippi, and they were so generous to Paul. They opened up their hearts to Paul, and, and they provided financial assistance on a number of occasions to Paul throughout his journeys. Uh, when he was in prison in Rome, the first imprisonment, uh, they sent a gift in the form of a very trusted and faithful brother, a brother of Epaphroditus. And, and even though he was well regarded by the Philippians, they said, look, go over to Rome to be with Paul. He's, he's this brother, Epaphroditus, he's a gift to Paul when he needs it the most. Uh, they were a loving, generous, kind ecclesia. When Paul writes to them, he says... Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no ecclesia communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. We ask the question, where did this wonderful spirit of care and kindness, love and compassion, of tending to the needs of others, where does that spirit come from? Well, no doubt they were brethren and sisters who were like that. But I've got a picture that this spirit came from a person like Luke. He's a key brother. He's there for the first six or so years of this ecclesia's development. And I believe that the spirit shown by the brothers and sisters at Philippi came in part from this 
this wonderful brother who's got these wonderful qualities. When he hears about the stories of Jesus, he's drawn to these type of qualities. And he displays those same type of qualities about caring and loving, being kind and compassionate. And, and, and so the ecclesia takes on board those qualities. I think there's a very important lesson for us in all of that. Now, we often hear the word today, influencers. I mean, I really hate that expression because it's, it's kind of in social media and you've got these awful people who become influencers. And you think, well, oh, they're not the sort of person that I like to be influenced by. But I think Luke was a classic influencer. He influenced the brothers and sisters around him at Philippi. And so, even though we don't like that expression, influencer, let's think about ourselves as influencers, right? And so, what can I do at this ecclesia that can influence my ecclesia for good? And so we're not here at Moorbank, nor me at Punchbowl, to just sit on a seat, to warm a seat, and to make up the numbers. We come through the Ecclesial Hall of a Sunday morning and we think, how can I do the very best I can to help my brothers and sisters here at Moorbank? How can I influence them for good? And if we're moved and motivated by those sort of thoughts, then we'll see Ecclesial life as about what can I do for others and how can I help at the same time if we've all got that mindset, we're receiving bucket loads of comfort and help from others in our ecclesia. And so let's think about Luke as we read through the record of Acts during our daily readings in the next week or two and see him as a classic influencer and see ourselves as, well, what am I doing to influence my brothers and sisters here at Moorbank? Well, where does Luke appear next in the record of Acts? Well, it's not till it's over in Acts 20 that we pick up the we again. Acts 20 in verse 6. Verse 5 of Acts 20. These going before tarried for us at Troas, and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. What we find here in Acts 20 is Paul at the end of his third journey. And so during the second journey, he comes to Philippi and leaves Luke at Philippi. And then Acts 20 is not for another six or so years after Paul's finished his second journey. He's finished his third journey. He's on the way to Jerusalem with a group of brothers who I believe are representatives of some Gentile ecclesias to go with Paul to Jerusalem to take the collection that the Gentile ecclesias had given to the impoverished believers at Jerusalem. And so, for instance, in verse 4 of chapter 20, there's, there's Sopata. He comes from the Ecclesia of Berea. He's there with Paul. Uh, there's Aristarchus. There's Secundus. They're from Thessalonica. Uh, there's Gaius. He's from the Ecclesia of Derby. Uh, from, from Ephesus, there's uh, Tychicus. There's Trophimus. You think, well, who's the representative from Philippi? Would Philippi have given any money? Of course they would have. They've got this wonderful, generous spirit of giving. And the Philippians would have given to the poor saints, uh, to the fund for the poor saints at Jerusalem. But, but who's their representative? Well, it's the we of verse 6. It's, it's Luke. He's the representative that goes with Paul uh, from the Ecclesia at Philippi. And so with Paul and this company, they make their way to Jerusalem. And as they make their way to Jerusalem, um, Luke sees Eutychus fall from a window and laying dead on the street under the window. And Luke, the doctor, will rush down. Can I, the doctor, can I, the physician, can I bring this person? Can I deal with him? Can I, can I, 
No, he's dead. And Luke, the physician, sees the power of God in the raising of Eutychus to life again. So Paul sees, or rather uh, Luke sees, the, the death and the resurrection of Eutychus. And then the company moves on further and they go to Miletus. And there at Miletus, the elders of Ephesus come to meet this group of brethren. And, 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 and Luke hears the words of the elders. Or rather, Luke hears the words of Paul to the elders. And Paul tells the elders at Ephesus, Ephesus, Now behold, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions are by me. And Luke hears those words of, of trouble ahead for you, Paul, at Jerusalem. And then Luke sees Agabus, the prophet, approaching Paul at Caesarea as they make their way further towards Jerusalem. And Luke sees Agabus take Paul's girdle and binds the girdle upon his own hands and feet. And Agabus says to Paul, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle and they'll deliver him to the Gentiles. And Luke and the others hear that. You think, well, troubles are ahead for Paul. And, and now's the time for me to slink off back to Philippi because I don't want to have anything to do with those sort of troubles. But of course, Luke doesn't slink off to Philippi. Luke stays the course, and so do the other brothers with Paul. And Luke stays with Paul for the rest of his life. Again, we don't see that in the record of Acts. Luke is flying under the radar, but from this point on, Luke is with Paul to the end of Paul's life. And so Paul does go to Jerusalem. We know he's arrested. Paul then spends two years in Caesarea. And I believe Luke is with him there. At Caesarea, Paul's, Paul receives a fairly, uh, uh, quite an easy imprisonment, uh, more so to keep him away from the Jews. And in Acts 23, it says that he was given liberty by Felix, that his companions were able to visit him in Caesarea. And I believe Luke would not have been very far away from Paul there at Caesarea. And I wonder, brothers and sisters, whether <clears throat> there at Caesarea for two whole years, a frustrating time for Paul. He wants to be in Rome, but he, he's in this uh, confinement in Caesarea and, and he helps Luke compile the gospel record. Paul possibly an eyewitness of some of the events of the life of Jesus. And during that period of time, I wonder whether Luke, um, not wasting his time, not idle, but puts together some of the events from the eyewitnesses that he hears about, men that had seen Jesus, including the Apostle Paul. And, and Luke is with Paul and Aristarchus as they make that voyage to Rome. Luke, the doctor, having to deal with a lot of sick people on that voyage to Rome. And, and, and Luke would have been there during the two years that Paul was in that hide house there with Paul as he writes letters to the Colossians, to the Ephesians, to the Philippians, and to Philemon. Look, they're listening to Paul as he dictates these letters to someone who writes them and then queries them off to these ecclesial centres. Luke would have been there during the time between his imprisonments, I believe. And then when Paul is taken back to Rome during his second imprisonment, Luke is with him still there. Paul's now aged, possibly sick as well, and he's got this beloved physician there at his right hand. The final mention of Luke in the Bible is in that passage that was read this morning in 2 Timothy chapter 4. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 as we draw our thoughts to conclusion this morning. Second Timothy is Paul's very last words, his very last letter. He knows he's about to die. He's in prison, and it's not a hide house this time, but it's a dark and a damp place. 
executioners awaiting him. And Paul, who loved the company of his brothers and sisters, who loved his fellow labourers, men that had that same focus on the kingdom of God, men that were a source of pain relief, well, well, they're deserting Paul now. Look at verse 10 of 2 Timothy 4. For Demas, he hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Verse 16, at my first answer, or the, the first hearing before the Roman authorities, at my first hearing, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Paul's by himself. Verse 11, only Luke is with me. And so Paul, during the closing stages of his life, Disciples now desert him because it's a very dangerous thing to be a Christian, a very dangerous thing to be associated with Jesus Christ or, or, or the Apostle Paul who's an advocate for Jesus Christ. It's really dangerous. Men have lost their life to be associated with Paul. But Luke, Luke stays to the bitter end. He's not ashamed of Paul. He's not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed of Jesus Christ. And in the same way that our Lord came to save and came to show love, care and kindness, Luke is there right to the end showing the same spirit towards his friend Paul. And possibly Luke was his only companion to see Paul taken outside the city of Rome to a place called Ostia and they're brutally beheaded by the Romans. And we think about Paul ending his life that way. Spare a thought for his friend Luke. Luke there to see that. And now Luke is by himself in a big and a hostile city. And now he's lost his very best friend. Uh, would Luke witness a death and resurrection like he'd done at Philippi? Would he witness a death and resurrection like he'd seen at Troas? Well, he certainly witnessed the death of a beloved friend and the great joy ahead of Luke is to see one day evidence that his friend is alive again. Because his friend Paul had this confidence about the resurrection of the dead. Look at the words which you know so very well in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 7 and 8. The words of the Apostle Paul, and Luke would have heard these words as, as Paul put them down. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, writes Paul, but unto all them that love his appearing. And so like Luke, brothers and sisters, we are not eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus Christ, but like Luke, we hear about those events, we believe those events, and we remember our Lord this morning as we now take the emblems. Our Lord came to seek to save that which was lost. And we're so glad he did that because he came to seek and to save each of us. He showed a wonderful spirit of care and kindness, love and compassion to others. And Luke, the beloved physician, was absolutely moved, I believe, by hearing those stories. The stories of kindness, compassion, love, uh, the preparedness to save. They, uh, they drew Luke to the record of Jesus Christ. He loved those stories and he put them in his gospel record. But you know what, brothers and sisters? Luke wasn't simply moved to write about those things. He was moved to also demonstrate that same spirit 
in his own life. The Ecclesia of Philippi, I'll show kindness, sympathy, love, compassion. I'll build this Ecclesia up. I'll be the best influencer ever for this Ecclesia. And when it came to his best friend, Paul, I'll show care and kindness, love and compassion to my very dear friend. And despite the danger, despite the difficulty, despite the fact that everyone's deserting Paul, I'll be there right to the very end. And so might we, brothers and sisters, be moved like Luke was when it came to thinking about Jesus Christ. Might it not be simply something that we do academically, but might it move us to say, well, if Jesus Christ was like that, shouldn't I be like that as well? And so let's be followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let also be followers of people like Paul and people like Luke that, that said, as far as we're concerned, we likewise will be a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. Might the spirit that was seen in Jesus, the spirit that we see in Luke, even though he flies under the radar, might that spirit be something that be seen in each of us.